Welcome, everyone. Uh, let me begin by briefly introducing myself. My name is Christopher Roberts. I am an assistant professor with the Faculty of Law at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I am currently serving as the chair of the new Transnational Legal History Group uh, under the auspices of the recently established Center for Comparative and Transnational Law within the Faculty of Law. This is one of the first uh, talks formally organized by the Transnational Legal History Group. We hope to organize many more events in the coming months uh, and years, however, and to gradually expand our community of legal history and socio-legal minded scholars. Uh, so please look out for announcements to come. Uh, and let me in fact make one announcement right now. We will be co-sponsoring together with the Comparative Constitutional Law Forum, a seminar on New Dominion Constitutionalism next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Uh, so please join us for that as well. Okay, let me begin with a word about format. Uh, after my brief introduction, Dr. Karakawala will present her work. Uh, Professor Vivena uh, will then present some of her observations, comments, and questions, to which Dr. Karakawala Akawala will respond. After that, we will open up the floor to questions from the audience. If you would like to pose a question, uh, please send me a private chat message at any time during the talk or during the discussion that follows uh, containing the substance of the question. And I will then use my power as moderator to either pose the question myself or uh, unmute you so you can pose it directly. Let me also inform you the event will be recorded and posted to the center's website shortly after its conclusion. Okay, uh, so much for the preliminaries. Uh, moving on to the substance of today's talk, we are immensely privileged to have with us today Dr. Rahala Karakawala, an innovative and inspirational legal scholar based in Mumbai. Dr. Karakawala has studied law in India and New York. Uh, she has served as a legal consultant with the Indian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in New Delhi and the World Bank in Kabul, and is a fellow with the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, and in addition to the book we will be discussing today, has published her work in journals such as the Indian Law Review and the Asian Journal of Law and Society. We are also immensely privileged to have with us uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong's very own uh, L Professor Laila Vavaina, an assistant professor with the Faculty of Anthropology, uh, who will be discussing the book. Professor uh, Vavaina's research focuses on the intersection of urban property and religious life within the legal regimes of contemporary India. She has published in journals such as uh, Modern Asian Studies and Political and Legal Anthropology Review. And she has a book manuscript, Trust Matters, Religious Endowments, Parsis and Property in Mumbai, forthcoming with Duke University Press. Uh, so we'll have to have her back to discuss that work before long. Okay, uh, I hope and imagine we have a fairly diverse crowd with us today. Uh, but let me conclude my introduction with a brief word pitched at the lawyers and legal academics and aspiring legal academics uh, in attendance in particular. As legal scholars, we are comfortable and familiar uh, with and most naturally gravitate towards studying law as a field of jurisprudence, examining the formal rules in particular areas, exploring the way they have evolved historically, or considering how they function in practice and how they might be amended to better serve uh, particular policy goals. We often devote less explicit attention, uh, though I'm sure we are very familiar with in practice, uh, to the various rituals, customs, hierarchical relationships, and material symbols and structures that make up the legal field uh, with which and within which we are habituated to operating. Dr. Krakowala's book masterfully explores this alternative area of study uh, with particular attention to the presidency courts uh, 
created uh, initially by the East India Company in Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras. In addition to its substantive insights, uh, I believe Dr. Karakawala's book uh, can be a great inspiration more broadly, uh, therefore, in terms of our ability to think about and grapple with alternative ways of investigating law as a lived experience, as a social field, and as an institution with particular effects within society. Uh, it is with great pleasure, therefore, that I welcome and hand over the floor to Dr. Karakawala. Good afternoon to everyone from India and good, e good evening to everyone in Hong Kong. Uh, thank you to Professor Roberts for his kind introduction and for inviting me to talk about my book. Uh, thank you to CUHK Law and the Center for Transnational and Comparative Law for organizing and hosting the seminar and to Professor Vivaina for being the discussant for the same. Uh, and thank you to Kate Wetter. Uh, she's here from Heart Publishers and she will mention later how the book might be purchased. Uh, for our discussion today, I will begin by introducing my book to all of you, uh, give you a brief overview of the chapters and highlight one facet from each chapter. My book is all about the judicial iconography and images of justice. And therefore, I have selected a few images to share with you uh, through this PowerPoint presentation. Um, Uh, From the Colonial to the Contemporary it explores a representation of law, images, and justice in the first three colonial high courts of India, located at Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras. Uh, it is based upon ethnographic research work and data collected uh, from interviews that I conducted with judges, lawyers, court staff, press reporters, and other persons associated with the courts. I attended court proceedings and documented an oral history uh, through these three courts. Uh, observing these three courts in practice, the book asks questions at different registers like the architecture, the dress, the language, and these are just to name a few. I will come back to them in detail later when I talk about uh, chapter six. Uh, observing the colonial high courts in terms of their visual representations and performativity depicts the court as a theater of justice, where justice must not only be done, but must also be seen to be done. Uh, so the Calcutta High Court, the Bombay High Court, and the Madras High Court, they were established in 1862 under colonial rule. And uh, they were constructed, the buildings that they are housed in were constructed by British engineers and architects. So they reflected the colonial notions of the time. And they continue to function out of the same buildings that were constructed for their use between 1872, starting with the Calcutta High Court, and ending in 1892 with the Madras High Court. So I also talk and write about the books in the order in which they were constructed. So beginning with Calcutta, followed by Bombay, and then Madras. Uh, so the book also addresses a very important interplay between law, history, and memory. And it depicts in graphic form how law controls the way history is remembered and recollected. And this is seen in all the three high courts. And uh, through this presentation, I will give you one example from the Calcutta High Court. Um, and. Uh, Another point to note is that the three high courts studied in this book, they share a recurring historical tension between the Indian and British notions of justice. Uh, this tension is apparent in the semiotics of the legal spaces of these three high courts and is transmitted through oral history as narrated by the people I interviewed, the judges, the lawyers, and the court staff. And the contemporary understandings of these court personnel are therefore seen to have deep historical roots. And in this context, the architecture and the judicial iconography of the high courts, they help to cons constitute, preserve, and reinforce the ambivalent relationship that the court shares with its own contested image. And as uh, Professor Roberts mentioned, my work is interdisciplinary, and it is a legal anthropology of the courts of India. So I look at how law behaves in court and how the social life of law. Um, the book overall is divided into seven chapters, and I hope to give you a short overview of each. At the end of my presentation, please feel free to ask any questions on parts that I might not have touched upon. 
And uh, even if you have any questions related to field work or research or writing, I'm happy to address all those questions. So moving on to chapter one. Uh, chapter one, it forms the introduction to my work on the visual culture of courts in India and how the law is represented through its relationship with the image. The introduction makes a case uh, for using iconography and semiotics and the relationship that these concepts share with law, visuality and culture. In framing the argument, I look at judicial iconography and the various allegories of justice that it purports. To specifically study the judicial iconography of courts in India, I depart from existing anthropological and sociological work by focusing on law and the image, while also using sociological methods to describe the visual. Uh, the chapter narrates the relationship of the three high courts with law, history, and memory, along with the colonial presence that continues within these spaces. Uh, this section uh, also um, introduces the argument of how law is an active participant in the manner in which history is written and memory is constructed, a theme that is highlighted through the three courts. Uh, it also talks about how I conducted my field work, my experiences in the field, and my method of study that I adopted. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was an ethnographic study of the courts. Uh, moving to chapter two. So chapter two, it reviews the literature in the visual field of law. Uh, it is organized around literature on the visual metaphor and in the scheme of justice, along with law's aesthetic policy that manifests in the way law polices various images. So the chapter is focused on the iconophobia generated towards the images controlled by the law and the complex relationship thus created between law, images, and identity. It also presents various images of justice as seen in courts and courtrooms and court buildings. I expand the framework of looking at the court only as a performative space and introduce the idea of observing the visual in the court. And I observe these characteristics by looking at different court structures from across the world. And moving from court buildings as a complete unit, I then also focus on the judicial iconography of the Statue of Justice. Uh, to illustrate the presence and most commonly, attribute, uh, commonly understood attribute of depicting justice, uh, I begin with il the il uh, existing literature on the evolution of the Statue of Justice. And this is followed by images of the Statue of Justice, which are contested images, actually, of statues, paintings, murals. And they've been contested on grounds of race, religion, gender, politics. And I observe how the representation of the Statue of Justice in different places and across different time frames, uh, how this behaves. And actually, I stumbled upon some very interesting images of the Statue of Justice in the course of my research, uh, some of which of the images are which in my book. Uh, now moving to chapter three, so uh, this begins by ethnographic work. So chapter three, four, and five, they are on the courts. So starting with chapter three is the Calcutta High Court. And I have a picture here for you of the two courts. Uh, the reason I have uh, these two pictures, an old one and a new one at present, uh, is to uh, where you can see the difference. Uh, so um, the picture on the right, I took it when I was in the field. Um, and it, at the 150 year celebration of the court, they painted over the Khan stone which, in which the, uh, the court is built with. And so you can see the difference in the color. So that kind of is also ties to the relationship that people have with heritage and how they use that in the thing. So you can see the other thing is uh, you cannot no more get a frontal view of the court because there are two buildings constructed right in front. So now the image on the right is how you see the court from the front. So you can't get actually an image that is on the left anymore. Uh, so talking about the Calcutta High Court, it presents its own relationship with its colonial past. And one of the judges uh, that I spoke to in the Calcutta High Court, uh, he mentioned that the city where it stands was built as a colonial city and that continues till today. So as some of you might be aware, before Delhi became the capital of, of British India, Calcutta was the capital till 1911. So that's the reference. And the colonial linkage is present in the Calcutta High Court, along with an adaptation of the Bengali culture from the people that inhabit the court. And this colonial association, it is unique to these three courts, but it plays a specific role in the way these courts function in a post-colonial era. And colonial rules of subordination, domination that were built into the creation of the structure, they permeate through the legal fabric of the High Court in a post-independence setting also. 
accepting the presence of the colonial in the background, it assists in contextualizing the relationship that this spot shares with its own visual culture. And one of my most favorite discoveries when I was in the field is linked to the Calcutta High Court. And therefore I've selected to share that story with you here. And it is the story of the link between the Calcutta High Court and the uh, Cloth Hall in Ypres, Belgium. And I'm gonna put some pictures up for you on the screen. Uh, so on the left is the Cloth Hall of uh, the original building of Ypres, the Cloth Hall in Belgium. And as you can see, it's very similar to the Calcutta High Court building. So it is a fact, a known fact, that the Calcutta High Court building was modeled on the 13th century uh, building of the uh, Cloth Hall in Ypres. And this is a fact that when you go to, when you visit the Calcutta High Court, it's something that everybody will tell you all the time. They will repeatedly tell you that uh, this is the Calcutta High Court and it was modeled on this building in Belgium. And even though people might not know any other facts, this is one fact that they will always tell you when you go to the court. Adding to that story is one more story that they'll tell you that when this building was destroyed, so the cloth hall of Ypres was destroyed in World War I. It was completely bombed down uh, by German bombings. So when it was, uh, it had to be reconstructed, uh, pe uh, the people from Ypres came to Calcutta to take the plans of the Calcutta High Court building so that they could use these plans in the reconstruction of the cloth hall in Ypres. And uh, as you, I mean, there's a picture on the right showing you that the building was completely bombed. So this is the, these are the two stories. And in fact, it was told to me and I didn't really, I mean, I just accepted it as a story and let it be. Um, there, is, there are notes from the sheriff of, this, of the town. There are speeches mentioned where they say that the people came from Belgium and uh, they did, uh, uh, the, the people came from Belgium and uh, they required the plans of the Calcutta High Court to reconstruct. So this is, it's there, there is written text and things about it. By sheer chance, I was at a conference where I met somebody who was from Ypres. And not only was he just from Ypres, uh, his grandfather was one of the architects involved in the reconstruction of the uh, cloth hall building. And when I mentioned to him about this Calcutta High Court, I think he said, you know, it's very strange because my mother and my grandfather, they always spoke about the reconstruction of the building but never did any mention come about Calcutta, but I could be wrong about it. So the best person to ask is my mother. And I actually had the opportunity to go to Ypres. I visited Ypres, I met his mother and I met people in the cloth hall building. Um, and they said, to me, they said to me that they had never heard of this building in Calcutta. They didn't know that there was a building in India that was modeled on the cloth hall of Ypres till I mentioned it to them. And she said like her, that her father never went to Calcutta and there was no such discussion. And they went on, of course, to give me some uh, kind of proof to show this point. And uh, what they showed me is that one part is that if you see in the picture, there's scaffolding already on the building. So it was already a 13th century building and it was due for reconstruction and uh, some restoration work. So there was already an architect hired and he already had the plans. He did not live in Ipo, he lived in a town outside. And so when the bombing started, he was able to secure all the plans and was able to move it out of the city. So when they decided to rebuild uh, the cloth hall, the plans were already ready. They were already available. So they did not need to go out anywhere else to get the plans. And the other thing is that, so when Ypres was bombed in World War I, after the bombing, the people of Ypres were given three options. One option was to rebuild the city as a modern city. One option was to leave it as an open war memorial and not, not touch it at all. And the third option was to rebuild the entire city as was, like as it used to be. And so the people of Ipo, they selected the third option and that's why they had to reconstruct. So here you will see the a reconstructed version and I, I took this picture when I was in Ipo. So that's how they rebuilt the building. Uh, and so the other thing, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, that's one part about it. And also the buildings are not exactly the same shape and height. And so it's not possible also that uh, they needed the Calcutta High Court plans because the two buildings are not exactly the same shape. Uh, but what does this, this kind of a story, uh, what does it tell us? So the evidence of this reality about the existing myth in the Calcutta High Court, it directs one to think of how history and memory are often reconfigured to materialize a specific pride and prestige. 
In this case, the myth that the cloth of uh, the cloth hall of Ipoh had to use the building plans of the Calcutta High Court to be rebuilt, it allows for an architectural history to mobilize a kind of form of pride associated with the history of the High Court. And through this myth, we are invited to revisit the colonial past of the High Court and this entire notion of gifting back to the Belgians their past through our present. And this idea of returning the gift has been uh, nurtured and inflected by the colonial idea of the rule of law as a gift to civilize the natives. So this returning of a gift by the former colony, it then also carries elements of reasserting the dignity of the colonized, if not its superiority in making a post-colonial circumstance. And this narrative of history, it is not an archival or a chronological notion of history. If one were to note that the Calcutta High Court as an institution did not feel the requirement to verify these fact with, facts with its Belgian counterpart. I mean, the story has been told so many times that it has actually become the truth. So rather this notion, it's embedded in a specific imagination of historical time, a time that is not collaborated through archives, dates or documents, but more through the idea of a pride materialized in a different imagination of history. And when I spoke to the researcher in Ypres, so the cloth hall of Ypres is no more a cloth hall, it's now a museum. So I spoke to one of the researchers there and he says that what is interesting to note is that the Calcutta High Court is one of the oldest buildings in the world with this architectural style and standing in a unique position of being older than the building that it was modeled on. So this offers an invitation to memorialize the connection with Ypres and Belgium in an alternative way. And you know, for me, this discovery was so fascinating that I thought I should highlight it here in this uh, while talking to you about my book. And it is one of the beauties, in my opinion, of doing field work, uh, actually. Okay, so moving on from the Calcutta High Court to the Bombay High Court, that's the court that was built next. And the, uh, that's the next chapter, chapter four. Um, in the Bombay High Court, I trace the history of the court, the establishment of its building, along with describing specific architectural char characteristics of the High Court, the judicial iconography, and the layout of the court. Um, inside the Bombay High Court, I focus on the central courtroom as an architectural site that refers to the court's institutional history. I further deliberate on how courts sometimes become spaces for political contestations, when law memorializes history. The institutional history of the Bombay High Court when traced through the architectural design and ornamental symbolism of its courtrooms is both a site of conserving history as well, of reinvest, uh, as well as of reinventing its legal history. So the visual narratives of the Bombay High Court, they allow us to take seriously uh, the way official imagery of courts is produced, organized and consumed. Um, and the Bombay High Court in itself, the chapter also, it has several sub stories. And so I'm just picking out one to share with you. And the judicial iconography in this court, it's very distinct. So I'm going to, I thought I should share some of the images with you here. Oh, so one, so first, of course, this is the High Court and the central courtroom that I mentioned, it's under the central section that you can see in the, in the center of the picture. Uh, so, uh, the judicial iconography is very distinct here. So some of the examples I want to show you is of certain carvings around the pillars of the court. And so you can see this uh, picture. It is a carving around one of the pillars. It has men of different uh, men. They all wearing different kind of head gear, headwear. Each headwear was a representation of the different communities and people that inhabited the city of Bombay. So this was to say that the court was open to everybody. The court was open to all. But a point to note here is that uh, they're only faces of men. Uh, the other interesting iconography images, uh, these are two favorite images of the court. On the left, you can see what is called the monkey judge. And on the right is a fox lawyer. So the monkey judge, as you can see, is holding scales, uh, a sword in one hand, and they have the, it has the blindfold, but it's across only one eye. And on the right hand side, you can see the fox uh, with the advocate's band uh, around the neck. And also there are references, you know, to how lawyers as foxes and things like that. Uh, but uh, the origin of these images, uh, though they are unknown, a few students were hired from the uh, School of Art of Bombay at that time, and they were commissioned to make these carvings around the court. So it is possible that they, this was their understanding of the justice, justice system. 
um, and it often leads to a lot of humor, as you can see, and sometimes contempt issues in court. Uh, for chapter four, I thought I'll read out a short passage from chapter four for you, something to just uh, pique your interest as is done in most book discussions. Um, and what I'm reading out, it highlights the con how the construction of the Bombay High Court building was critiqued right from its inception. And the description is from the Times of India editorial of 1879. And I thought that is worth noting. I'm going to put up a picture while I read the text. I'm going to put up a picture of the central courtroom of the Bombay High Court on the screen. And I think that will help you in understanding what I'm reading out. So I'm going to just see the picture. So I'm uh, reading out from page 124 in chapter uh, four. Even with the transition from the old to the new, some problems have followed the court since its inception. In 1879, the editor of the Bombay Gazette categorically spoke about how the court that was built for the public was designed in a manner that was most inconvenient to the public. The editor compared the arrangements inside the courtroom to those of the caste system, wherein only people who were given the best comforts were the judges, barristers, or other officials of the court. Here, Caste acts as a metaphor for spatial, temporal, corporal, and visual separation between the experts, which the upper caste Brahmins were considered to be, and the non-experts, that is, the so-called lower castes and the outcasts, who were never allowed access to the experts' knowledge. The reference to the structure of the courtroom is thus similar to the structure of the caste system, with the division of the upper castes, the judges, and the lower castes, the people coming to seek justice and their placement in the psychological and physical hierarchy of societal norms. It is relatively less known that, on completion, the Bombay High Court building met with stinging criticism in the colonial press. On 21st March 1879, the Times of India carried an editorial piece that extensively critiqued the architecture of the Bombay High Court, both externally and internally. Fuller was reproached for the discomfort he had so ingenuously contrived to entail upon many generations of the legal profession in India through the construction of an unfeasible high court building. The editorial berates the extravagant expenditure of constructing the court building, adding that public, memory had, uh, public money had never been spent on a hindrance for people in a manner worse than that displayed in these court premises. The editorial critiqued the very design of the building and its interior plan. The editorial mentions that Fuller was looking only after outside effect and therefore seems to have planned the shell of the building first and then to have thrust in his courts and chambers and staircases where he could. The architect was criticized for his focus on the external majesty of the building while ignoring practical requirements of the profession thus, and now I quote, on the highest platform, almost out of sight and hearing, sits the judge on a carved teak throne. Below him, the court officials. The senior counsel are only allowed five chairs in front of a short table on the lowest platform of all. The junior counsel are banished to the edge of another raised platform at the back, utterly away from their seniors. And their chairs are placed so as to be in constant peril of a sheer drop of five feet. For this reason, most of them stand clutching onto something. No kind of accommodation is provided for the solicitors or their clerks so that it is impossible for either to hold any communication with the gentlemen they are instructing, while the junior counsel are completely cut off from the seniors with whom they are acting. The result is simple. Not one fifth of the bar practicing in Bombay can ever find seats at all. The judge cannot hear the counsel, the counsel cannot hear the witnesses, and the reporters who are seated on the tiles among the public below can see neither the one nor the other while to anyone who ventures into the gallery, the whole thing is a dumb show. So uh, I've read this out to you and I will come back to the context of the building structure in chapter seven, uh, when I argue about the way courts are structured and how this might hinder access to justice. Uh, so now moving on to the last court, uh, the Madras High Court uh, in chapter five. Uh, the Madras High Court it embodies annals of history in different ways from the Bombay High Court and the Calcutta High Court, and it creates a very unique visual history for itself that speaks to the past, present, and future. 
and an integral part of the Madras High Court and its complex are the presence of two lighthouses uh, that were used by the port city of Madras. And I'm just going to put up the picture. So, well, that's the Madras High Court. Uh, and the two lighthouses that I mentioned are here. Uh, so as you actually can see in this, the, the center dome right at the top, that's the lighthouse of the Madras High Court. Um, so uh, the lighthouses are very integral uh, to the Madras High Court and the presence of the lighthouse uh, on the dome top of the Madras High Court building has, left to has led to several analogies to say that the lighthouse is uh, playing the role of a beacon of justice the same way a statue of justice might play that role in other courts and the Madras High Court does not have any uh, that kind of image of the statue of justice. Um, and also a lot of references to it being the light to guide people towards law and justice and things like that. Uh, the in, uh, also along with this, the installation of certain statues has met with a lot of protests in the Madras High Court, which reflects on law's iconophobia, signaling the deeply equivocal relationship between law and the image it projects. The controversies and debates on statues in the High Court ranges uh, from the colonial period till the current time. So uh, earlier period, uh, earlier people were allowed to actually come up to the top and visit the lighthouse. Uh, however, this has been stopped since. And uh, the Madras High Court, as I mentioned, does not have any Statue of Justice in the popular rendition as we understand it. And so this lighthouse kind of signifies and plays that role. Uh, and I've decided to talk to you about the statues in the Madras High Court. Uh, so I picked three statues to talk. There are more, but I picked three to talk about. And there's one inside the High Court and two in the compound of the High Court. And all the, these three statues, they've had a history of protest. And as at that time, uh, there was a strong opposition to venerating humans through stone statues. One lawyer explained to me that this was because uh, uh, pers uh, venerating persons through statues was alien to the religions of Hinduism and Islam. For Hindus, a statue could only be erected of God. And for Muslims, there was no physical form of God and therefore statues were opposed by all. So you see the first statue on your left, the marble statue, that is of Justice Ayer. There were protests uh, against installing this as the first statue in the court. And uh, because the idea was that it was, in, the idea of installing statues was European and it did not exist as part of Indian culture. However, the British judges disregarded these objections from the Indians and the statue was nonetheless installed. Uh, there's a story there about the British sculptor who was unable to get the drape of the garment right as he had no idea about how this garment looked on an individual. So, and this is some po a point that they discussed till today that the draping of that garment is incorrect because it was done by a British uh, sculptor. Uh, and as you can see, if, you know, if you notice in the, sta in the statue, it's not wearing, the statue is not wearing any shoes. And this is connected to how Indian lawyers were made to remove their shoes in deference to their British masters. So during early British rule, uh, there was a controversy if Indians were allowed to wear shoes or not. Initially, it was not permitted, but later when the plague spread, it was believed that the illness could be spread through plague if Indians walked around barefoot. And so then they were allowed to wear footwear into the court. And this process of subjugation and colonial regulation, it was viewed, it viewed uh, Indians adoption of European etiquettes as a presumptuous claim to equality. And this manifested not only in this way, in different ways, like for example, Indians were not allowed to sit on chairs during court proceedings. Okay. So the second statue, the one in the center is of Justice Ayangar. He was the first Indian advocate general of this court. And the opposition to his statue actually came from the British judges as they had, uh, in general, they had opposed the appointment of an Indian to this post. So when the idea had come to put a statue, they had opposed that also. Uh, the third statue on your right, a complete right, it was installed as recently as 2010, and that is of Dr. Ambedkar, who many of you might know was the chairman of the Constitution Drafting Committee, the Constitution of India, uh, amongst other things. And it is this this statue is protested uh, against till today, and many people say it was a political move to place it here, and often it is not included in the count of the number of statues associated with the court. Uh, there is a thread of Dalit politics associated with that entire situation. Uh, there are other statues, but I have restricted myself to talking about these three. Maybe later in our discussion, we can talk about uh, how the Black Lives Matter uh, movement and its relationship with the statues. Uh, so moving to chapter six, uh, it, 
It works towards tying the theory and literature that form the base of the argument with the ethnography of the three courts. So it brings everything together and comparing the three courts in one platform. So looking at the fieldwork of the three courts, uh, it brings them together in the same framework for the first time. And creating a visual link between these courts, it assists in understanding the role of judicial iconography that pervades all judicial structures, ancient and modern. Using a semiotic perspective and understanding the symbolic relations between the existing notions and ideas allows for a transmission of a new meaning through different signs and motives. Uh, here on the screen, as you can see, I have listed down the various registers at which I compare the three high courts. And these were also the issues on which I based my research questions when I was doing my ethnographic study in the field. And coming now to chapter seven, the conclusion. Um, chapter seven, it ties the ideas of semiotics of law and judicial iconography to the way justice is accessed in courts. So judicial iconography exists and it is a tool through which the court maintains its legitimacy and a particular majesty and dignity for itself. The architectural structure of the court, along with the portraits, carvings, courtroom design, they all form part of the visual field of law. In addition to this form of the ocular, the visual also manifests itself uh, through the registers that I mentioned just before in chapter six. So speaking to persons associated with the court, Along the lines of these different registers, it points towards the ambivalent relationship that is shared between law and the image. Uh, law tends to control the image, thereby controlling the discourse on the way courts are perceived and viewed. So in this, in my concluding chapter, I use Franz, Franz Kafka's parable before the law. And it is a short two page parable. It's appended at the end of my book. And I definitely recommend one should read it. It is a very short narrative of, and I'm just summarizing this for you in two lines. Uh, it's a narrative of a man who attempts to access the law, but he is prevented from doing so by a gatekeeper. This man waits outside the open gate of the law for years to gain entry till he reaches his dying days. At that time, the gatekeeper closes the gate, saying no one else can uh, gain entry since his entry had only been assigned for him. So the parable relates to the different hindrances one faces in accessing the courts of law and how there are several barriers, like the gatekeeper, preventing access. So these can be, as I mentioned in chapter six, uh, the language of the court, the dress code, the way the court is built and structured. And this relates back uh, to chapter four, the paragraph I read out to you in chapter four on the Bombay High Court about how the structure of the building can also cause hindrances to accessing justice. And um, also the part of daily ceremony and ritual that makes one alien to the court amongst other aspects. So Kafka's text is a short and it's a must read. So I'm gonna end here and stop. Uh, I hope I have been able to give you a brief view of my book. I look forward to the comments from Professor Vivaina and Professor Roberts. And thank you everyone for listening in. Okay, this, uh, we'll get back to this uh, when uh, Kate Wetter from Heart, she will mention how the book can be purchased. So I guess I can stop my screen share. Thank you so much, uh, Rahula, for that fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, so without further ado, let me hand over the floor to Professor uh, Vivaina to uh, share her thoughts and, and reflections on the book. Hi, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to say, first of all, um, thank you to Professor Roberts and Dr. Um, Korakiwala for inviting me. And um, while my um, expertise is not really on legal aesthetics, I'm very, very happy to be part of this book forum and to share a few of my thoughts on this very comprehensive book about the aesthetics and iconography of three of India's high courts. So from the colonial to the contemporary is at once minutely detailed, right? We can see um, um, the author talks in, in very much detail about carvings of the court, how they were done, um, styles of images of justice in the court, but also gestures to some large and really enduring questions about the place of law in India, the role of history in a post-colonial state, and about the way institu institutions do or at least ought to change. Um, so these are key questions that relate to so many debates on constitutionalism, and culture. I mean, I'm, I'm an anthropologist, um, and anthropologists are often asking these same questions about how societies should and ought to change um, as they transition from, say, a colonial to post-colonial society. 
Um, and I think all these questions also reflect the author's sort of bivalent role of both a practitioner of law as well as a researcher of these courts. So I've only had um, um, experience in two of India's high courts during my field work as an anthropologist. Uh, the case that brought me to the Bombay High Court um, was very important to my study of Parsi endowments in Mumbai. And in fact, my research showed that contemporary Parsis go to court often in lieu of mediating conflicting, their conflicting claims through their own communal channels. Um, so the, I think for certain minority communities, especially elite um, colonial minorities, um, the Indian courts have a very different space than say other minorities like Dalits. Um, have um, in the court process. Um, so Mitra Sharafi, an amazing legal historian, um, often cited in the book, has shown that um, this um, ha has much to do with the fact that Parsis and some other colonial elites are overrepresented in the Indian legal profession in proportion to the size of their communities. And my research on Parsis um, um, goes more than, in contemporary um, times says that Parsis go to court so often because endowments, specifically public charitable endowments, are their biggest landlords. And at the, the Bombay High Court, um, as the author points out in her chapter on, the, on this court, adjudicates Parsi marriages and divorce issues, which is the only time that the jury system re is retained in Indian law. Um, so I actually spent many days in cramped courtroom number 40, the famous or um, infamous Justice Davers Court, um, which the author talks about um, in quite detail, um, hearing arguments on an originary summons, um, which deals with the judgment from 1908 on what exactly were the sacred or secular aspects of a trust that manages religious space. And one of the important themes of the judgment that I witnessed issued in 2011 was how much is a public charitable trust actually public? And this is one of the large themes of the book. So my, one of the big question I have um, for the discussion is for whom is the high court? Who is the audience of the court? And this is very specific to the Indian context and even more specific to the context of the presidency courts. Um, so the author insightfully explores these issues through the very materiality um, of very, really specific things like when are microphones used? Um, for instance, in my um, time in the courts, it was incredibly difficult to hear um, not the judge, but, um, but what the lawyers and solicitors were actually asking and speaking about. Um, so the, the, the issue of when are microphones used, when are they actually turned on, even if they are present in the court, um, what paths, literally, how does a litigant walk through space to enter a courtroom? Are they expected to stand to the side when the, when the justice moves past? And when are gallery spaces, which are supposed to be for the public, closed to serve almost anyone and actually used as storage space or to manage um, a newly installed AC unit, right? So these are, um, through the sort of um, ethnographic research, we can really um, dig into these kind of details. And so one you know, thing says, as an appellate court, it is clearly the high courts are one link in a chain of appeals that will find its ultimate end at the Indian Supreme Court. Um, as Dr. Karakiwala writes, the audience of the court is neither the litigant nor the public really. And with the horrible acoustics in the room, it seems like even when the lawyers cannot hear what the justices are saying sometimes. So if not for litigants, journalists, or the general public, then for whom? So the author shows that much of the design of these courts cater to their main users, if you will, so justices and lawyers. She shows that often the grandest courtrooms that you would expect the chief justice to have are often not chosen um, for their courtrooms, but the judges actually choose the courtrooms that have the largest chambers attached, right? Because we, um, she really moves us to think about these spaces also as workspaces. These are spaces where the law is produced. Um, <clears throat> and then um, really interesting details like, even though uh, cigarette smoking is outlawed in the courts, a stall selling um, all sorts of things will also sell cigarettes within the court complex. I mean, it, I think it is these small notes that offer such an interesting ethnographic behind the scenes look at these courts, um, which from the outside seems so formal and proper to most people. 
Um, so this um, brings me to a book that I'm also concurrently reading, which is uh, Rohit Day's uh, relatively recent book, A People's Constitution, which is very interesting to think along with um, um, Dr. Karakiwala's book, as Day points to the ways that very ordinary litigants used con constitutional challenges to reshape the relationship between the citizen and the state in India. And so um, another question I have is what um, the author saw as the kind of relationship that the aesthetics of the three high courts called forth for litigants in particular. Um, I know they weren't the bulk of her field um, research, but I would really like to know. And is overwhelming awe, right? This, these beautiful, sometimes Gothic buildings um, and in their massive scale, um, um, is overwhelming awe the kind of aesthetic that suits a democracy, a contemporary democracy? In her field research, how did litigants discuss their interpretations of the arts and statues if they even noticed them, right? Um, um, or, or the design of the courts or how they had to proceed through um, the court spaces. I mentioned this because um, the second high court experience I had was at the Gujarat High Court in Ahmedabad. And unlike the courts, um, that the author has researched, the Gujarat High Court is, a, I would say, is a modernist labyrinth. Um, at least it was for me. I was lost several times along with many other litigants. We were all running around trying to figure out where, when, because the board is placed where your court is, is assigned, and people kept running around and trying to figure out, and which caused a lot of anxiety for a lot of people who were not the expert practitioners of the court. So I wanted to ask further, what are some of the aesthetic differences between the former presidency courts, Bombay, Madras, Calcutta, from other high courts, besides just the time of building? Since many of these were built after independence, do their aesthetics con contribute to a different experience? Um, do they have the same iconophobia as the colonial, uh, and um, because they do not carry that kind of colonial burdens um, in concretized in their own buildings? Um, Again, I visited the Gujarat High Court as a researcher to hear arguments in a case brought forth by a Parsi woman who was suing her trust who managed the Rastrian funerary space because they had banned all intermarried women from attending funerals. So she was suing um, along gen lines of gender discrimination. And one key theme in the case was whether gender discrimination, which was outlawed by the Constitution of 1950, could be brought against a trust, so an institution that much predated India's independence. And this theme too runs throughout um, the book. What matters of law, procedure, even etiquette, should a post-colonial court conserve in our times? For example, um, and I thought this was quite amusing um, to listen to the debates about this, how appropriate is it to call a secular judge in a democracy my lordship? Right, which some of the lawyers wish to retain, some of the judges wish to retain as a note of respect. Um, also, what about the temporality beyond the past and present his, historical temporality? Do you, um, do, does the author think any of the court design could aid in the process of law? And Indian law is famous for its sort of glacial pace, right? Sometimes a court case outlives the litigant itself, um, themselves. Um, so in a lot of my interlocutors in the field actually said that they inherited court cases from their parents because it took so long to, to move through the courts. Um, and most poignantly, I found in the book, um, the author's discussion of the trial of Tilak and the ways it was commemorated in the Bombay High Court. Um, so this, this begs the question, how does one balance the acknowledgement of a legal or perhaps moral error of the court in the past and keep and retain the authority and prestige of the court in the present? Um, so the answer seems to be to memorialize that court, keeping that injustice as part of an unjust colonial past. So keeping it in the past, right? Don't use that court because that brings it all up again. Um, and this issue of the Bombay High Court bleeds into the city as well and the other um, two cities as it reckons with its colonial past and perhaps nativist present, especially with the issue of naming as the city itself and the streets and landmarks bear new names, right? Um, and the, but the High Court remains the Bombay High Court. Um, further emphasizing the dual nature of these cities um, between colonial past and present and how um, they oscillate in methods of conservation and heritage. So um, 
Tilak's judgment and punishment by a native judge, right, Justice Daver, who um, the author writes of quite uh, in detail about in the book, had some calling for Justice Daver's portrait to be removed from the court. And this issue brings up the ways in which native judges and elites were complicit in colonial governmentality. Interestingly, Parsis recall Justice Daver with a different view. He was a Parsi judge and was instrumental in forging judgments that encouraged if, encouraged, if not favored, Parsi institutions in colonial law, like the trust, for example. He also heard several of some of the key ca cases of the community. So he is an interesting figure to discuss, um, sort of very bivalent figure of native complicity with colonial rule, yet always still an advocate for his own community, even if it's sort of discriminatory in that sense. So um, I just wanted to um, finish up by thanking um, Dr. Karakiwala for such a fascinating behind the scenes look at three of India's prominent high courts. And I would love to hear from her more on the implications of law's methods of secrecy, its iconophobia, as she puts it, and what she thinks that implies about its nature as a public institution. So how do we reconcile the court as a beacon of justice, right, with these lighthouses, while it, keep, while it so stridently protects its own secrecy? Um, and I had a further question um, about the new, perhaps new, maybe it's not so new, the new security apparatus that is, um, uh, you know, before one enters the court, um, especially um, under the, um, the, the Indian government's um, attempt to root out terrorism or, or violence at the court. So there's this, all these different security hurdles to, to, before entering the court. And if the new um, ID card situation has also entered into how the public can enter the court. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Bebeina, uh, for those, you know, that, that very careful reading, bringing up so many, uh, I think, of the, the uh, fascinating open issues, really, within the book. And, and I'm sure the, the audience as well can see, you know, even though this is an, ex an exploration of these particular presidency courts in India and, and the particular issues attaching to them, so many of the thematics um, have, have so much resonance, I think, for, for lawyers across jurisdictions. Um, so Dr. Krakawala, uh, what, you know, there, there was a lot to pick up on there. Um, so please just uh, uh, follow up on the threads um, uh, that, 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 that uh, engage you um, uh, and as, as you wish. Okay, so I'm just gonna try and answer and then you can let me know if this. So you had asked, uh, the big question, uh, who is the audience of the court? And that is the question, I mean, a thread that I carry out through. So then who is this court for? If you are saying, so uh, for example, when I, in the Calcutta High Court, so you know the, the courtroom are very crowded. So in the Calcutta High Court, when I was asking people about, you know, the structure of the court and the fact that they're crowded and things like that, one of the lawyers said to me that litigants should not be allowed to come to court, the High Court, because uh, that way there'll be more space, you know. So when he said that, that's your first question, that who is the court built for? Isn't the court built for the litigants or is it built for the lawyers and the judges? Like, who is the person? And it's the same idea with this, like this is deep obsession with the dress code, that you must have this dress code. And when I said, why is it required and can you do without it? No, the lawyers need a dress code. They have to be shown apart and different from the others. So who is the others and who is the person for the court? And that comes out basically as an hindrance in every stage is what I noticed and what I realized that these kind of conditions, they change who the audience of the court is. And most often than not is what you notice is that the person whose case is being argued right up in the front has no idea of what is happening in the court procedures and uh, the mic system. And this actually also uh, comes, uh, it kind of joins into your second point about um, the relationship of the aesthetics with the litigants. So I litigants were not my pool, not the people that I interviewed. But while I did my field work, I would uh, change my dress code on and off. So sometimes I would go to court dressed like casually, or like a litigant. Sometimes I would go dressed as a lawyer, or like, you know, wearing the black and white, the gown. So my relationship with the court also changed a lot based on my own dress code. So when I was dressed as a lawyer sitting in the court observing, a lot of litigants would approach me to ask questions because they had nobody, literally nobody else to ask the questions to. 
So I remember like litigants asking me questions like, can we drink water in court? Is it okay if I carry this plastic bag? Because in one of the Bombay High Courts, one of the judges, they have a sign outside saying no plastic bags allowed because of the sound uh, that it makes. So, you know, and in one of the courtrooms, I observed in front of me, it happened, the law, uh, the litigant, uh, as soon, and he was complaining to me about his lawyer. He was like, my lawyer doesn't tell me exactly what is going on. Can you explain to me what's happening in my case? And as soon as his lawyer entered the courtroom, he got up from the stand where he was sitting and he went and touched the lawyer's feet. So it's a very like complicated relationship where on one hand you, you have this entire veneration and you're like, I need to do this to my lawyer. But he was also kind of complaining to this random person whom he thought I was an advocate about the situation that was going on. So, uh, so and uh, many times people in the, uh, when I used to always sit in the last row, uh, because that's where I could observe and write about the court the best. So over there, you can really not hear the court. And like you mentioned, it's not about the judge. You can hear the judge because the judge is facing you and the uh, voice is carrying forward. But it's the lawyers and the people talking to the judge that you can't hear. And mostly that's also kind of what you want to hear because that's your case being argued. So very often I would be asked by law people sitting at the back, what did the lawyer say? What did the judge say? Do you, do you understand what was happening? And it was because I was dressed in black and white that this, and this wearing of black and white, it kind of gives you an access. In fact, in Madras, I never even wore the entire court uniform, which is the gown and the band. I only just wore like a black, uh, white and black pants, you know, that was just like basic. But it was assumed that I was a lawyer and I was given access to the advocate's entry and I could enter all the courtrooms as a advocate, you know, so just that change of dress code, it brought about so much change in behavior. And in fact, in the Calcutta High Court, if you were not dressed as I mean, if you were not dressed as a lawyer, you could not enter the courtroom with even a pen or paper. So how do you function? You can't even take your bag inside. So a litigant coming from God knows where, traveling all this distance, you can't even there's no there's no lock, there's no safe, secure place, they'd like leave your bag outside the courtroom you know that it's probably going to get stolen, but you can't enter the courtroom because if you're not an advocate, it's not allowed. So these are the like upteen number of barriers that are just there. And it, yeah, and like you find it all across. And in fact, as a lawyer myself, I had a very difficult time accessing the Calcutta High Court. So I can barely imagine how hard it would be for a litigant in such a circumstance. And um, coming to a uh, very good point that you raised actually about how the Gujarat High Court is very different. So that is definitely true. So the reason why I picked these three courts is that they were colonial courts. They were built at the colonial time. When colonizers came into the colony, as we all know, building large buildings, and it was a statement, it was a stamp to say that they had arrived. And especially in the most important aspects, which is law and uh, government and administration. So they always built these large buildings that were a sign. So you have this huge court, Calcutta High Court building and you have this huge Bombay High Court Madras and these huge buildings. And uh, so one of the questions I did ask is to litigate, uh, to, even to lawyers actually ask this question, that the first time you came to the court, did you feel a sense of awe or sense of fear towards the court? So people who either parents were lawyers they did not find that sense of fear, but people who were completely new, they always felt like the building was like very large and imposing and overarching onto them. And you will see across the world courts, that's the story of judicial iconography, that courts are built in this large overimposing structures, which look down at you. They're always elevated from the main, from the road. So you always have to look up, you have to climb up. When you enter the court also, judges are sitting at an elevated position. So again, you're looking up then you have to bow down to a judge. Then many courtrooms, if you see the old courtrooms at least, they have portraits hanging inside courtrooms and the portraits are very large and they also look down on you. So the entire structure, the entire ceremony, in fact, one of the judges in the Bombay High Court, he very clearly said to me, he said, if all this ritual wasn't there, where when I walked in, you didn't stand up, you didn't bow. If I drop a pencil and if the court clerk doesn't pick it up, like if I go to pick it up, it would not, like if me as the same judge sitting with wearing pant and shirt sitting on a table across you, that same judgment that I passed would not have the same binding effect that it has because of the entire theater of the court. And that's a very acknowledged thing. So it, it, it's like it's there to kind of create the distance. 
And uh, so, so what I meant to say is that uh, I got uh, off track. So these three courts were built, as I mentioned, in the late 1800s. Uh, you, come, you come to the Supreme Court of India, which was constructed, it's a post-colonial construct, 1960s construction. You come to the, uh, the Delhi High Court, these are all post-colonial, or the Gujarat High Court, for example. And they are very different. These three colonial courts, they have embedded this colonial culture so deeply, like the word of the use of the word lordship. In these courts, they use it as a like a conjunction in their sentences. They keep using the word your lordship. And you'll see that a lot in the Bombay High Court and the Calcutta High Court. But you won't see that that often in the uh, in the Delhi High Court, the, the use of the word. Also, this obsession with the dress code, like even till today, Calcutta High Court is just not like Calcutta Bombay. They are not even Madras, not willing to let go of the gown. Uh, and Delhi, on that hand, in the summer months, they have passed a resolution that you don't have to wear the black gown in summer because it's just so hot. But uh, the lawyers in Calcutta had also wished to do something of the same, but that never passed. Because of this kind of inherent attachment to this colonial, uh, uh, entire colonial situation. And a lot of it is about when you enter the court. So when you go to the court also, you can kind of sense it and feel it. So you, uh, there are certain practices, for example, in the Bombay High Court, uh, lawyers will still charge the council, the arguing council, they still charge in uh, GMs. So GM is gold mohar. Now that's not the currency anymore. But when you get the docket of the charges, it will be in GM and then you have to the client and the lawyer, whatever the firm has to calculate. What is the calculation? One is one GM is to how many? And many times clients will be like, what is GM? Like grams or what, what does it mean? Like nobody understands. And why are you using that system when it is so this is like happening in the Bombay High Court till today and why is it happening it's just like these colonial traditions you won't find that in the Delhi High Court I mean you're not going to find somebody using GMs in a court like Delhi or other courts so I think there is um, uh, yeah the dress code these these kind of aspects are very much uh, I think very present and I in my research I do feel that the structure of the court I won't say has a direct impact on the way justice is the way orders or judgments are delivered. But I do say that it definitely has a way in the which you kind of approach the court and uh, the way you hold on to certain traditions. And I've, the story that I narrated about Calcutta and Ipoh, I think that comes from this very strong colonial, like the Calcutta High Court, it's not only that they smoke cigarettes, or the reference that you made, they actually are smoking like pipes, like and they're walking around the court and smoking is completely banned in public places. There were judges I interviewed in the Calcutta High Court who were smoking while I was interviewing them inside their judge's chamber. And there are signs across the court, across the court building which say smoking is banned. And uh, I, in fact, spoke to one of the lawyers who had like, who said that he was participating in the entire ban of smoking in the court. And he vehemently denied, he was like, no, nobody smokes around the court. But I mean, you walk around the court and you can see it. And every morning they sweep out five kilos of cigarette butt from the court. So if nobody's smoking in the court and you're denying and you're in so much denial that anybody's smoking, out, where is this like uh, uh, cigarette butt coming from, you know? So those are the kind of things and I feel like they won't let go of certain things because they believe that that's their tradition and they just can't let go of it. And I think that comes from this entire colonial formation that's there in these courts. And, um, uh, about the security that you mentioned, the security apparatus uh, and law and secrecy. So actually the courts used to be open for anyone. Even now the courts are all open for anyone to enter and exit. But earlier it was without the security. It was unfortunately after the 26-11 terror attacks that happened in Bombay is when the government, I mean, installed this across places. So it's not only the courts, it's like government buildings, courts, hotels, theaters, cinema houses, everything has the same system. So you can still go to court, but you have to go through a security check system. In the bomb, in these three courts, Calcutta, Bombay, Madras, the high courts, it's fine. You do it, but you can't take a camera in at all. It's absolutely completely forbidden because photography is banned across these three courts, which also I talk about how the fact that photography is banned leads to this idea of secrecy in the courts. And because you've never seen what the court is like, that's why when you go there, you're in this kind of shock and awe because everything is in secrecy. When I asked people, why is photography banned? They were like, we have no idea, but that's the rule. So we must follow it. So you cannot take photographs. 
So therefore, it was really difficult for me to get photographs from inside the court because it's impossible to get the permission for the same. But the Supreme Court, and when they implemented the security measure, now the Supreme Court has actually kind of become inaccessible. Not because again, on paper, it's not that you can't go there. It's just that now you need a particular Supreme Court pass. And as an advocate, you can get it. That's fine. Any advocate can get it. But if you're a regular person who wants to just visit the court, you need to apply for a pass through a advocate's firm. Again, that is not a such a, I mean, you can find an advocate's firm and you can apply. But the thing is that not every, it's not that easy for everybody to do that. It's not possible to just show up at the Supreme Court and walk in. That has stopped. And that is actually very, very unfortunate because in the end, it's the Supreme Court and people come from all over and litigants and things. I mean, litigants are allowed if you have a case. But again, your lawyer has to fill in the pass and it's a big, uh, long process. But what Professor Vivaina, I think, was referring to is I mentioned in Chapter 7 uh, about the Delhi High Court. And you need an ID card, a government-issued ID card to enter the court. And one of the litigants missed their hearing in court and a judgment was passed against that person saying that he's not, he's not coming and appearing in his appearances. And he was stuck outside the court because he didn't have a government approved ID card to enter the court. So that is where that entire thing that you, how important is this government ID card that is restricting a person from entering for to hear their own matter. But that is, that's the rule in the, like, you might presume that, oh, everybody has a government ID card, but that's not the case. And so this person wasn't allowed. So that's the case I refer to as how this is also one more hindrance in the access to justice, like the gatekeeper in Kafka's parable. So I think I, I hope that I picked up on all the threads that you mentioned. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Uh, you did indeed uh, manage to cover those threads, those numerous threads admirably. admirably, admirably. Uh, I want to open up the floor to questions from the audience now. Um, I will uh, take uh, the moderator's privilege of posing the first uh, question. And this is perhaps to follow up on one of the themes that was just brought out in the discussion, um, particularly around, I think, one of the central uh, thematics brought out by your book that's so interesting uh, is, as you put it, law's interest in controlling the image, controlling visuality, and so forth. Um, and I'm particularly interested uh, in that context in uh, sort of when these images were inaugurated and in the possibility of change over time. Um, so one thing, right, one thing that I think comes out really clearly, you're looking at these courts uh, that were established before the 20th century. Um, the 19th century in particular really sees law rolled out in a much more extensive way. It has a particular sort of, you know, you, you, you feel uh, a certain historical weight behind, behind these buildings, for example. Um, but at the same time, right, they're, they're, they're clearly designed to inspire awe and majesty. They, they capture a little bit of that. There's something that they get from their long history and pedigree, but perhaps you know, they start to seem antiquated at the same time or something else. Um, you discussed a little bit in the book various different, I suppose, debates about whether or not to create additional court buildings or reform the court buildings. Um, and you also mentioned, perhaps uh, others in attendance are aware of as well, that uh, I think at one point the South African Constitutional Court, which is something of a global model for redesigning a court building to have a more egalitarian structure to, to very self-consciously tackling a lot of the hierarchies built into the physical space of traditional courtrooms. So I guess uh, uh, my, my question in those regards is how, you know, how, how likely do you think it is that there will be um, reforms of some of these court spaces? Are there any you know, I'm, I'm sure there are some voices calling for redesigning things in a more egalitarian manner. Do you think um, they would have those, those types of calls would have some success? 
um, at any point in, in the coming future, uh, or is that you know uh, hard to imagine? And maybe related to that, one thing you brought out in the book that I think is concentrated around the same themes uh, were these discussions of um, the use of bans on the use of photography in the courtroom, bans on video recording, um, and bans on live telecasts, but at the same time, the growing use of CCTV cameras. Uh, so similarly to this issue of the actual redesign of the courtrooms, whether you see you know, the, the related issue of, of who can hear, who has access, who can, who can sort of see into the courtroom, um, whether there you see any possibility for that opening up or, or whether that will remain sort of this in this more closed uh, protected idiom. Um, so to, actually it's a good question you brought up about reforms very interestingly created by the coronavirus pandemic uh, everything is closed right India went into a complete lockdown so along with that even the courts closed therefore now we have virtual courts and it kind of happened unexpectedly unplanned. Now when I interviewed people in uh, all the courts and I said should you have video recording of courts, should you have live telecasting, there was like an emphatic no, like people were like no, the court is a public space, if somebody wants to know what's happening in the court, they can come and visit the court but there's no need to record, there's no need for any kind of photography, should, it should continue to be banned because it's a sacred space and you shouldn't take pictures of such places, that is a continuous narrative across all the three courts. Now due to the pandemic, we, it's all gone virtual. Part of this, so now because it's virtual, it's kind of all automatically video recorded because they're using kind of apps like this to access the court. Also a directive has been passed that you don't need to wear the entire dress code. You can step it down one and you can dress formally and that would be accepted. But you should respect the court nonetheless because it's a court. So you kind of see this change. The question is whether this change will continue after the pandemic ends and when the court reopens. And I don't think so. I think that they will continue with their original uh, dress code and things like that. If you tell, if you make this argument to somebody about video recording, they will tell you that uh, this is not really considered as video recording because yes, it is being recorded, but it's not accessible to anybody. A video recording of a court would be one that would then later you could find, maybe like, you know, observe it. So they would tell you that this current form of virtual courts is not the same as video recording of courts. And uh, uh, so I think, and uh, about the redesigning, there are a lot of heritage committees in these colonial courts and they kind of, the court has modernized over time, right? So now you have mic systems, which not everybody uses, but they are there. Then you have the air conditioning system, which used to not be there, of course, in any of the courts. So to install all of this, the entire, like they have electronic court boards now, which earlier was like probably handwritten. So to bring all those changes, the courts have changed completely, right? Like, so Professor Vavina mentioned the galleries that I talk about in the central courtroom, they are now used for uh, air conditioning ducts. So all the courts have had to adapt this modernizing kind of aspects into the court. In some courts, it hasn't really been done well. So you see the Calcutta High Court, it's, uh, the building is a rectangle in a rectangle. So right in the center of the thing, is a, there used to be a very beautiful garden. They've actually, half of it has now been constructed, a three-story building has been constructed inside, the, inside that center, which is the air conditioning unit, like some air conditioning unit. And so, I mean, for somebody, I mean, I, I, I did not, think much of it and I really wondered that how could they have not thought of some other way to kind of bring in this air conditioning system but a lot of lawyers were like no it's too hot you know and the system is required it doesn't matter then whether the court building is ruined by that or not it's irrelevant so I think for certain aspects where the lawyers feel that it is worth discarding the heritage or whatever they believe then they are willing to make those changes but in certain aspects I think when it comes to actual uh, functioning in the court and I don't think that's what they are letting go of because uh, they're not letting go of the gown or the dress code and they're very entrenched in that so 
I don't see, I didn't find any movements to reform uh, while I was uh, working, like to change the system or to change the language, to drop the use of Latin phrases, which mostly nobody understands, things like that. Uh, did not come across. In fact, when I interviewed people, they were more, some judges, in fact, wanted to go back to the system of wearing the wig, which the which came down from the British and you are literally being like, why would you want to wear that wig? So some people were like, no, that kind of gives you heritage or prestige or whatever they believe. So I, I think there's a mix and I don't think there's that much uh, want or anything to change in that sense. I don't know if I've been able to address your question. Yes, definitely. Um, uh, so uh, we have a question uh, from uh, one of the members of the uh, audience um, who's asking if you could say a little bit more about the role of language uh, in and around the courts, um, both in general terms um, and in terms of specific terminology, including addressing whether there's a linguistic hierarchy uh, and whether there's translation uh, into local languages and how linguistic issues have changed, if, if in fact they have since the colonial era. Uh, so the issue of language, it's, uh, I think one can write an entire separate book on just that. And I covered it in a very small part in chapter six. So language I look at in two forms in the book. Uh, one is the way you address the court. So that is what we discussed already about how you call uh, your lordship, how you refer to the judges as your lordship and how that term of veneration in itself is something that is a, a problematic at some level. And it kind of already brings in the hierarchy, right? When you refer to somebody as your lordship. And uh, in fact, I once was doing a moot court in, in another country where they don't use the word lordship. And uh, because it's so habituated to us, I kind of just said, oh, your lordship. In, and they use the word sir or your honor. And the judge was like, oh, that sounds so much better. I actually prefer being called lordship to your honor. You know, so it, it's a continuous thing. There, there is a bar council notification that says that there's no need to use the word lordship anymore. It says that you should not, in the high courts, you should use the word your honor. And in the lower courts, you can even say sir or your honor or either, but it still continues to be used. Nobody has stopped using it, even though there's a notification saying that it doesn't, it's not required to be used. And one lawyer in Calcutta, he mentioned to me that he practices in the high court and the lower courts. So in the lower courts, it's common to say your, uh, to say your honor or sir and not use the word lordship. So he was shifting between the courts. So by mistake, he refer, I mean, he calls the lower court judge your lordship. And the opposite side says, oh, look, you know, he's a high court lawyer and he's bringing his high court language to the court and he shouldn't because it's not supposed to be done in the lower court. And the lawyer looks to the judge and says, wouldn't you prefer if I refer to you as your lordship other than anything else? And the judge agrees and is like, yeah, I mean, that kind of veneration is better. So that's one aspect of uh, language. But I think the question refers more to the other aspect that I also talk about in the book is what language is used in court. So the high courts, I mean, well, the language in the higher courts in India is English. Though English is not the, I mean, it's not the largest spoken language. It is somehow has become the only unifying language, I would say, a, a language that has not, uh, because there's been a lot of language protests in India, and I'm not sure if everyone would be aware of that. So India doesn't have any official language. We have two, uh, sorry, India doesn't have a national language. We have two official languages. That's uh, English and Hindi. And so all notifications and everything are passed in those languages. But when you come to the states, each state has its own language. So they use their languages. So when you come to the lower courts, the district courts, they, you're allowed to use your own state language. Now, once you come to the high court, the language of the courts is English, but you can make a request to argue in your state language. But uh, there's another system that's followed in the courts wherein the chief justice of each high court comes from another court, from another state. So if you were to bring a chief justice from Gujarat to Maharashtra, to Bombay, they would not know the language of the state, right? Because India is div divided on linguistic lines. So you, a person coming from Gujarat would not know Marathi, the language of the state of Maharashtra. 
So it would be in general difficult. That's one one of the many reasons why it would be difficult for because an advocate in India is allowed to practice across the country. So if I if if the language of Madras was Tamil and Bombay was Marathi and I was an advocate from Maharashtra and going to Madras, it would become difficult for me to practice because I would not be able to know the language. When I was in these courts, often people would break into Tamil and English and go back and forth when they were having their discussions with the judges. But the everything is recorded and documented in English and that's the law that it has to be documented in English. And so when you come from, a lot of people I asked, that should the language change to the local language? And even though they were very people who were opposed to this colonialism and opposed to this kind of Western influence, they still said that actually we don't have much of a choice because what language would you take that would unify? Because if you had to do translations from every high court, that would only increase the cost of litigation and increase the time. And as Professor Vavaina already mentioned, like litigation in India, it takes forever. So that would only increase the time. It would not help in any way. It would add cost because each page would have to be officially translated. It's already a problem from like the district courts. You need official translations when documents come to the high court. So then from the high court, if you had to further go to Supreme Court and do it, it would, it's now kind of become a practical impossibility in that sense of language. So this language debate is always raging, but across everybody that I interviewed, they said that, yeah, we don't favor English, but we understand that there is no other choice to use other than English because it has kind of become a language that unifies everybody without really wanting to make it that language. Because even Hindi is not spoken by the majority of people in India. So that like when you go down to South India, there's completely different languages. So there's no one language that you can say is spoken by the majority. So these were the two ways in which I looked at language. And yeah, that's... Okay, brilliant, thanks. Um, we also have a question uh, from my colleague, Professor Abhiratna. Um, I will unmute him so, so he can ask it. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. This was absolutely fascinating. Uh, I used to live and work in India, so this is really nice. Makes me even somewhat nostalgic. Um, though having been to the, high the Bombay High Court and seeing how chaotic it is, I'm not that keen uh, to go back. Anyway, I, I just had a very simple question, which was just about the change in names of the cities vis-a-vis -vis the non-change in names of the court. So what do we make of the fact that we have the Bombay High Court the Calcutta High Court, the Madras High Court, sitting in Mumbai, uh, Kolkata, and Chennai, respectively. Is there anything to be drawn from that, or is it just a kind of accident that the kind of nationalist forces that changed the cities just kind of forgot to change the name of the courts? No, no, the nationalist forces, they don't forget anything. Uh, so uh, it, actually, it's not actually it's very important. It's also one of the registers at which I look at the court in Chapter 6, and it's a very important part. It hasn't, it's not a forgotten uh, part at all. So as you mentioned, uh, over time, uh, nationalist forces changed the name of the cities. There was a big movement to change the name of the high courts at that time itself, because they said that if you can't be the high court of Bombay, when you are actually the court for the whole state of Maharashtra, and any which way that uh, Bombay itself is not there, it's Mumbai. So either you become the high court of Mumbai. But the three high courts were formed under a letters patent and by the queen at that time. And so it, said, it was said that you have to edit out that letters patent to kind of rename the courts. And the courts at that time uh, avoided and were able to pass off without having to change the name. In fact, in the Bombay High Court, it continuously, there's continuously public interest litigations filed to change the name of the court. So what they have done now is that they say it's the High Court of Bombay with judicature at Mumbai. So they've kind of adapted both. Now, if when I went to the three courts, the three courts react to the situation in the three ways that they are. So the Calcutta High Court steeped so much into its colonial traditions. They were totally against the name of the change, change of the name of the High Court. They was like, we are completely opposed to it. It should be called the Calcutta High Court. That's its name. That's what it's known as. It's not about the area of the city. It's just that's what the court was built as. And in fact, they say that they go further one step to say that even Calcutta, the city, should not have been renamed Kolkata. It should be always called Calcutta. And that should also be changed back. So that's Calcutta. Then you go to Madras, which has 
uh, from all these three courts, which has kind of let go of this colonial uh, impressions a lot. So in Madras, they are, in fact, the lawyers themselves want to change the name of the court. And they say that it shouldn't just become the High Court of Chennai, it should become the High Court of Tamil Nadu, because it's the court for the entire state. It's not for this. So that's going on in Madras. So when you speak to people in Madras, they say, yes, the name of the court should be changed. And the third is the Bombay High Court, where people are a bit like half and half neutral. And then I've told you what they did, the High Court of Bombay with judicature. Recently, uh, two years back, or three years back, the finally parliament passed a bill, a High Court name, uh, alteration of name of the High Court bill. It's been passed. Well, the bill lapsed over time. It hasn't yet become an act. When this bill was passed, these three, for these, it was passed for these three high courts to change their names. The three high courts reacted in exactly the same way as they had reacted when I asked them the questions in the field. So the Calcutta High Court wrote a scathing letter being like, nothing doing, you can't control us, we are not going to change our name. Madras High Court was like, yes, yes, we are ready to change our name, we want to become the High Court of uh, Tamil Nadu. And the Bombay High Court was like neutral, they were, they sent a like, they were like, okay, we'll see when, once it becomes an act, what to do. But uh, it's, it's a very divided thing and it, it really like, I mean, if you speak to certain parts of people, they will want to change the name and you speak to certain people, they won't. And just for the audience in general, uh, this, when Bombay's name was changed to Mumbai in 1995, they imposed it so strictly that even if you were to receive a letter from outside which said Bombay as your address instead of having changed it to Mumbai, the postman would actually come to your door and burn the letter in front of you. It was that intense. The nationalist movement was like very intense about the change of the name. So if you ever wrote Bombay, things would not get delivered to you. And uh, it would be like you'd face a severe backlash. It's not as bad anymore, but they went around the city to any institutions that had the name Bombay in it, and they would take a black spray and they would spray it around the name. So you can imagine that, of course, the Bombay High Court somehow held through that and they weren't able to change the name of the court, but they still keep filing public interest litigations to change the name. And it's an ongoing debate, continuous time is taken in parliament to discuss this. So, yeah. No one has forgotten. <laughs> okay, so there are some more uh, fantastic questions that have been sent to me, but unfortunately um, we're running out of time for today. Uh, so everyone, uh, please uh, join me in uh, thanking Dr. Karakawala for her fantastic uh, presentation uh, of her book and Professor Vivaina uh, for her stimulating uh, comments and, and, and uh, questions relative to, to the thematics that were raised. Uh, I wish we could uh, have even more time for discussion, but, but such is the nature of these events. Um, so, uh, thanks.